become a fashion media and communication with international magic present hyper hyper bodies the summit on the role of bodies in a more than human world So I guess, like, first of all, has anyone got any any questions or uh, any um, things that they possibly uh, want to clarify or any kind of feedback in relation to the, the two talks? Um, yeah. <laughs> that was almost like we were scripted. Right? <laughs> we were. I really loved I really loved both of the talks, and I thought that there were quite a lot of parallels there, especially around um, the kind of subjective interface of like the character or conversational interface. And I um, really loved how in Le Grand uh, talk, you've talked about um, AI or different systems adopt, adopting enough of characteristics without being being what it intends to be. And, um, and also the kind of, um, and in relation to subjective interface, in the morning, Daniel and I were talking about jailbreaking chat GPT. I saw that. Um, <laughs> which is like copying a prompt, copying a prompt that allows the chat GPT to pretend to go on another trajectory, which is jailbreaking it. And the kind of, um, my feedback for the jailbreaking or like my review of it was kind of like, it seems to be pretending that it's being so free and unrestricted, but it's actually still following the kind of, um, still still following chat GPT's usual logic. So it's, it's more of a character that it's put on rather than it actually fulfilling the the uh, the uh, fulfilling the actual characteristics of a jail broken uh, chat GPT. So I was wondering if you th uh, what do you think about that for both of you? Uh, I I think I see the similar um, maybe the same tweets about how the how it break the jail. Actually, it's uh, already improved a lot. In the beginning, when chat GPT released in the last December, like in the first day, everyone find the figure out how to like break yeah. the jail like yeah. there's a, the most famous one is like a uh, step by step how to destroy the human civilization and the thing i think often they already kind of give some restrictions but because this is generative ai this is the natural ability or a natural we can call it feature about it to go beyond our uh, imagination and restrictions you can have some very strict rules like keywords or you can have some detections, but it's always, it will always have some way, especially in language, the thing we cannot predict to, um, to, break, to break the rules. I think it's, uh, I think it's in two ways. One, one thing is like for uh, similar, similar imagination happens before, like the Lambda, if ever heard about, one of the Google engineer uh, claims that their language model, which uh, Lambda, not ChatGPT, Lambda, has the self-consciousness and he posts like kind of a paper or a list of the chat history and he claimed, insists like it has the conscious and he is fired after that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's um, uh, everything we've seen uh, technically is just uh, our imagination or it's a kind of a mirror of reflection, our interpretation because this is a t they are just the language model, to be honest. But the thing is good for us, especially as the creators, to have our own imagination definition about what this means. So I, I always like to see this kind of story, how it breaks the jail. Even create, after breaking the jail, what it will do. I think it's leave us, some, um, leave us for some space to imagine and to create. Mm. Um. Yeah, I agree with that. The the metaphor of the mirror, I think, is really accurate. I think a nice another anecdote just about like ChatGPT is that it was released as part of like this AI language model arms race, and they're actually working on GPT four, which mm -hmm. has been under development for like two more years than the ChatGPT project. So <clears throat> I also think like we have to be aware that we're just like experimenting and being gu guinea pigs so that they can figure out how to deal with a lot of the policy regulation regulatory things that they're working on um, so that when they roll out GPT-4 they'll be prepared so this is also like a social experiment as much as we're experimenting with the tool itself 
<clears throat> I love the concept of jailbreaking as a word because it seems like there is this a lot of tension with like restrictions of like tech companies and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and um, and I think the the way we think about I'll probably save that <laughs> another time. Then if anyone has any questions. Um, no, I was just really interested in what you think about the kind of uh, rule, rule breaking as a practice of like a designer or an artist and uh, how you work with um, these kind of systems. Mm, I think because I'm always working with dialogue system, so I always face the problem. It's uh, actually it's uh, always an argument or controversial in the field, especially in game development, because its authority as well be kind of. Uh, the, this, this will influence or even hurts the authority of the of the developer or artist. But I think it depends on do you want to use this kind of glitch or jailbreaking as a feature or a topic to discuss. If not, then it was just a, just a solve um, with uh, how one one the system. If you use the conversational system, is somebody try to break it or try to mislead it? Do you want these things to happen? Or if it happens, do you think your work is not working anymore? I think it's just a leap for uh, developers or leap for creators to think about. It depends. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's quite rele relevant to um, what you see as in uh, in coherent worlds as well. Mm -hmm. It's about the given rules and what happens when like mm -hmm. there's a bit of like seamlessness to it, but also some kind of room for. Yeah, I sometimes actually this is uh, interesting. Like because sometimes when my AI is not performing, sometimes it's because, for example, uh, I don't have money in OpenAI, <laughs> or uh, their server break break uh, broken, or one of the API not working. I always just kind of make a story, make up a story. Okay, okay. Uh, her like wonder the chatbot said. Okay, her her detector has some problem. We are solving that. Or her airplane is just broke. It was just <laughs> broken. We are trying to solve that. Please wait. So we are using this kind of this kind of tiny stories or explanations to let people. Uh, I don't want to easily to explain everything um, behind this to keep some sp space of imagination. Mm -hmm. It depends, I think. Um, what can I add to that? Do you have something, Yima? Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Maybe it was also more for the first question. I mean, I think it's related, but I think uh, for the uh, the work you saw that uh, was with Teresa and Boris Johnson, we used uh, a version of GPT, which was GPT-2. And then it was interesting to see the correlation and kind of the improvement between GPT-2 and GPT-3, because GPT-2 was very much more um, kind of almost more creative than GPT-3, which is much more standardized also to reach to a larger audience, which has much more like block in terms of like language use. So there's something very like Anglo-Saxon and universal in the kind of language that is used in compared to GPT-2 where we had like, well, we had both like kind of poetry, like it was world creation, like erosion, like between like Europe and uh, erosion. There was lots of like kind of words creation and words meeting that was super nice, but there was also like a lot of like, like a, a racial bias and a discriminatory uh, talks and so on. So we had to do a lot of editing and creating here, like almost GPT-2 was more like, um, yeah, breaking the rule than, than, than we could even ever imagine. So yeah, that's just this correlation also between like who can access the tool versus, uh, and when you come become a large uh, public tool, then there's also a lot of like homogenization and smoothening of um, how it's, um, its ability to create at least. Um, are there any uh, other questions? Oh, I, I really like the slides um, where you were talking about um, human conversation within, like, I guess, like the shadows of the internet, like WhatsApp groups and Telegram groups, etc. What do you think the impact of like having a tool like chat, having access to that information, will have um, in the future? Is that for? Is that for yeah, me? Oh, oh, uh, this is, uh, as an <coughs> artist, I want to use this. Um, I always want to introduce uh, the, the bots or AI in the in the human group. I think this kind of re relationship happens. Their conversation is kind of become my material uh, to create. But I think in in a sense, 
um, of technology or uh, like human-computer interactions, it might be a bit dangerous if people are not fully aware about what's happening here. So this is a kind of um, it's kind of tricky. Like if if you explain everything to to people about here is an AI, it's just a conversational uh, system, don't believe anything it said, it might be wrong. It will be different from as you said, okay, here is a person or here is a character uh, with a story. I think it's a, there's a space about how clear um, a developer want to be about, um, about the AI agent they bring. But I think this, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what will happen here. But I think for now, at least, I'm kind of glad that uh, the language model haven't reached everything <laughs> yeah. inside human society. Leave some space for, um, leave some space to discuss. Yeah, actually, I was curious about that too because you were saying um, the large language model, da high quality data is almost finished, and these models don't have access to like um, personal relationship building, mm -hmm. but. D won't Google develop tools based on like email exchanges and Facebook based on WhatsApp exchanges, like on a metadata level? Or I just I'm I'm genuinely curious. Okay, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out. But because but you can think like email is different from close school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 don't always like send emails. At least I don't send emails to my parents. I send tell to my parents in in WhatsApp, uh, not not in WeChat or. Um, or in the messaging software, and this one doesn't currently doesn't allow the access from external because you, they declare at least they, they they need to clarify everything you have inside the conversation is private. Yeah. You don't they don't have access for you to for for the training for now. But I don't know what will happen in the future. I think this kind of conflicts already happens like in. Uh, in like in art station, I've ever seen recently there are some artists declare like don't use my art um, to tr to train the AI, but yeah. that's also different because that's public information. Yeah. We still have we have a kind of a personal space in the mm. in the private area, but not sure what will happen in future. If Twitter or like if Telegram or WhatsApp declare like okay everything you you saying now will be used for AI, I think they will at least they will need to inform us, mm. <laughs> not. But not right now. I might have something to add. Because some conversations on WhatsApp, for example, they're end-to-end uh, -end encrypted. So mm -hmm. even the system doesn't have access to the conversation. But also, um, recently, it was really interesting to hear like Amazon or like different tech companies telling their employers not to leak company secrets into chat GPT or like these kind of um, AI systems. It's because it's hard to trace who's leaked it. And then it's going to yeah. just proliferate that way. So. Well, um, there is an opportunity for that to happen as well, mm -hmm. which changes the way we think about privacy and like secrets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess mm -hmm. especially when um, a lot of uh, a lot of contemporary organisations their their principal value is based on their kind of ownership of IP and certain sort of patents and information around supply chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, like Mackenzie Walk writes quite uh, well about this, you know, like these kind of like these meta companies, um, not meta as in, or they're, they're one of them, but uh, are kind of like on a layer above um, like material production and they're kind of overseeing this kind of vectors of information and um, they describe this as principally the kind of ownership of that information and the kind of navigation of that information. So it, would, it is interesting in terms of like that, that, um, slippage of privacy also goes two ways, right? I mean, at least in principle. Yeah. So it would be maybe that there is something possibly kind of interesting about like what happens if a lot of the kind of um, information that is very private to someone like Amazon gets kind of leaked out. And um, I don't know, like what happens then? Not, it'll be interesting to, to, to find out, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess one of the questions I was having, I was thinking it was, was about um, yeah, I mean, I, get, I guess about these kind of more closed communities, or so I was thinking of like in Discord, where you know, kind of dark forests is often sort of what they're kind of referred to, is it, it these um, which are premised on this idea of being kind of outside of kind of um, the clear net view, I guess. Um, and in those spaces, there's also the opportunity to sort of 
um, take on different identities and characteristics. Mm. And so there is also, like, built into these kind of uh, dark forest communities, there is a sense that one can sort of uh, create characters. Mm. So I was just kind of curious in the sense of sort of like what happened, what can you imagine what that would be like if there would be AI uh, characters in these kind of channels, say for instance, like what, what that would be? Because I, I mean, I was kind of thinking about it, thinking like potentially I wouldn't know. I mean, in a way, I wouldn't really care, mm. but I wouldn't know if I was speaking to a kind of an advanced AI uh. character or someone like a shit poster who's uh, kind of whatever. I, I sort of wouldn't necessarily know. I d personally, I wouldn't really care because uh. I think it would just be interesting as a thing. But but I was kind of curious about that sort of sense of these these communities also potentially being this space for mm. more character um, or fictional sort of dynamics, I guess. Mm -hmm. Where something like Facebook or Instagram is kind of yeah, it's kind of more restrictive in that sense, mm. for fiction building, potentially. Mm. Mm, yeah, I guess what's interesting about like the dark forest or the like, cozy core communities or whatever is the, um, the new governance systems that mm. they require and people have to like govern themselves. And I think more than the like, technology necessarily that comes out of each of those groups will be these governance models mm. And um, communities will have to decide for themselves in the same way they do with ship posters, where they're like, you know, this person has abused their platform, the platform three times, so we'll get rid of them. Or, you know, they, they're going to come up with their own system of rules, and maybe by the end, like, the AI bots will be the majority because they have figured out how to not break the mm. rules. <laughs> and that will be, you know, the kind of community that that governance structure fosters maybe it'll be a certain point where like you have to uh, at least Act like, like, post, like <laughs> three ship posts that are <laughs> offensive to x amount of people to prove that you're not a, not a bot in some way <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, yeah um yeah i mean i guess the, the the kind of other question that i had was really to do with this idea of like fiction and and i guess like prediction mm -hmm. and it was interesting like yesterday a number of the speakers who also sort of talked about uh, AI as this kind of predict um, its potential ability to kind of predict the future, or at least kind of the projections of it being able to kind of predict the future. And, um, and it, I was just kind of curious in terms of this relationship between kind of fiction and prediction, because it seems like in in both your talks mm -hmm. you were sort of both sort of like touching on these two subjects, which seemed seem incredibly close to each other, although on the surface they seem almost like polar opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just kind of curious in terms of how that that dual dynamic fiction and prediction sort of work in your work and your relationships with these AI systems. Mm. I think it's uh, very tricky because actually the, the current language model, uh, if I didn't understand it wrong, is based on the transformers, which means it's actually a prediction model. Like it mm. predicts the next term mm. um, of what you mentioned before. So it's literally, in fact, mm. always prediction about what should it say next at mm. least what it say next but i think for fiction sides i'm not very i'm not very professional in literature but i think it's still for me it's subjective mm. uh, it's for example uh, the engineer in google he believes lambda has the self-consciousness it's a kind of subjective uh, view about mm. uh, is this is this real have conscious or or not so i think this um, leaves space for us to each people will have different um, will have a different will. If you, this, I think this thing is, um, for example, now you, you know AI is not super good at drawing uh, images. And some people are like, now some artists are using the, the AI model to tweaking their image. Like they render a 3D, which is already super good, and they use the AI to add a, a filter or to put more details and they released the image. People said, okay, what a good work. And people, many people think they are fraud uh, when they realize this by AI. And they suddenly change their views at what a, sh what a shit artwork. Mm -hmm. But I think this is, is totally subjective when they think it's by AI or by human. So I think it's very, it's very depends mm -hmm. on uh, who are viewing it. And I think, I think it's, uh, I, I, cannot con I cannot control or predict how the public or uh, people think about 
uh, do they sh should they believe or they won't believe in the, what AI said or AI created? Mm -hmm. it's, it's leave for public to interpret. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to say something to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think to go back to the prediction and the fiction idea, I think something that we're looking a lot at is like the process uh, of the prediction, how the prediction is built, like from the very starting uh, from the database to the model to the output. But we're also looking at like kind of the recursive effect of this prediction on the real. And that's maybe what we could call fiction is like how it fiction the present or fiction the real, like through this prediction and how it becomes like a version of reality that becomes our real. So we're interested in how like that impacts uh, like the present. And yeah, we call it fiction, but uh, that's just another term for maybe reality. And I think like with all of the works, um, they've also been a, a way for us to learn about the models themselves by having to like work with the developers to build them from scratch. So. We <clears throat> have used like GPT-2 and stuff in the past, but for us, it's like a learning process and through it, we learn how fragile they are and how so, m depending on what parameters you give it, there are so many possible um, predictions. And um, for us, that's where the idea of fiction started to come from because it was very much like, well, <clears throat> with these parameters, this prediction happens with these parameters, that prediction happens. So you have to learn to use them as a tool and not imagine them as like an oracle. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think language becomes really important because uh, for a long time in the art world, we were using this kind of like mis machine hallucination and uh, machine oracles and things like that. But it's a very imprecise language that Mm -hmm. um, does a real disservice to the way that art can like open up a system for for an audience and for the practitioners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was really interested in that case study of like people not believing um, in the artist's skill because a tool was used, and I think that's the public's interpretation of AI is also a matter of PR. And I think what you mentioned about um, things being partially engineered, like virtuality being partially engineered is exactly the case for like the public's perception of like interpretation of AI as a tool as well. So I was wondering what you think about that. Um, yeah. I think uh, for me, like the public's uh, reaction or interpretation is like, should for me, it's a part of the work. Like I open that space. But the thing is, it will. It still depends on the form or material or the or the focus of of each artist. Some artists are using, as, as like some animators are using AI to generate the background. I think Netflix just recently did that with a Japanese animation, and so every, every all the people, most people are like criticizing them um, in the in the comments. So it's still, I think it's, um, it still depends. But for me, I I use I use like the public's participation. As, as, a, as kind of as a study or observation. For example, in my Discord channel, I have several bots. They, actually, they are not talking with each other, but people feel like they are talking with each other. And I see their discussion, and I really enjoy that. But I think it's also because, like as for me, I, as the developer, I put some lines about uh, these are developed by me, they are AI, don't believe everything is said. I think it's well. It's it so depends on how people will make that. For example, there's a one famous case of GPT-3 that someone, a, a developer, made a philosophy philosopher AI, and it's replying to all the Reddit posts about the philosophy discussion. And only after a week, people realize it's a robot and it's banned because that that Reddit uh, block doesn't allow. Uh, doesn't allow chatbots. But for me, I cannot do that because I'm a PhD student. It cannot pass the ethical <laughs> application. <laughs> but I think uh, in this way, this in this in clarity, this halluc hallucination is part. It's part of the idea of that developer. So I think how you how you control how you tweak the public's uh, expectation is also part of the artist um, who want to collaborating with AI. It's a material. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I, was, I was thinking, I mean, I guess it kind of touched on that. I guess I was um, wondering, like, how um, your 
engagement with these um, AI systems models, um, how it has changed how you think and how you work with them as you have worked with them. So like, um, has it kind of, through working with them, have you, has it changed significantly like how you think about them and then potentially like how you would or how you would work with them or how potentially they will be used by creative um, practitioners in the current and near future? Um, I think, yeah, basically just reiterating what I said, for us it was really important to work with the material and I think we, when we um, prepared our talk, we mentioned to each other, oh, does it sound like we're really anti-tech? Maybe, because, you know, those particular works were more cr critique. But I would say that, like, we're just curious. We're very, we come at it with curiosity. And we understand that there's um, technical aspects, social aspects, and political aspects. And maybe you have to play all of these three slightly differently. Um, so, like, in terms of my own, maybe Gimai can also speak to it, my own like position on it is that this technology s feels very inevitable, but there are so certain social boundaries or guardrails that we can create. Like, I personally think that the UK government should be investing in producing publicly owned data sets. That this should be like a priority of the cultural sector to be working on publicly owned data sets. Um, and they should be keep competing with places like OpenAI. Um, that would be one way that like the citizenry could be as involved as we were able to be in thinking of what kind of interface, what kind of um, data cleaning, like to be part of each step, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just to add, um, um, I think something that we are also interested in through the project, uh, there's always a kind of audience participation in our work. Uh, I feel like this is also for us like a way of um, looking at the technology differently. Um, I think uh, maybe some of the work we didn't show, but like the karaoke is a good example as well. To have also like feedback from the audience on both like kind of the apparatus that we created, like the environment we create so, so for the work itself and how we display technology in a very specific way through so creating interface, like also physical environment, but also on the technology itself. I feel like there's always this uh, work of like that is also unpacking the technology to an audience that is maybe not aware that even this technology exists. Um, so I think that's where also where we learn a lot, not only through the working process, but also through showing our work to an audience. And that's something that uh, yeah, we're also working towards unpacking a bit more on how to make the exhibition time also learning time and getting uh, more feedback on the work. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's like, uh, to be honest, like in the, at least in the past uh, two or three years, most things happen very naturally. Like uh, for me, like the things, for example, uh, image AI turned from GAN to disco diffusion uh, to, to stable diffusion. So it's kind of a, become a scale in the process. So I'm not that very surprised, but the reason what's because I, I don't have a hallucination to AI anymore because I need to I need to develop everything behind it. So I only need to think about what public will think about it. But I think that my view changed a bit recently because because it's it's so it's it's so strong. It's so too many applications, all the developers and artists are discussing and try to think about what kind of work it will help with or will replace even. Mm -hmm. uh, so so recently just in the recent few months, and when I start to working on, on anything, even when I was working on the slides today, I'm thinking about which part of, of the things I'm working on can be automatic, mm. can be not be replaced, but be refined by mm. the AI system. I, mean, I think it's kind of now the technology has forced me to imagine how the future will be like. It's because it feels like all the, all the things I type down might be generated by AI in future. Mm -hmm. But as I'm always asking myself, I don't have the answer for now, but I'm asking, is that good? Or do I like it? Or should I let it happen? Uh, so in this way, which parts of my creation is valuable? Which part is not? So I think it's forced us to think, to think about um, what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a movie called Arrival. 
Mm. But mm. Uh, the original fiction is by Ted Chiang. So it's about an alien uh, teaching a language to a, uh, to a researcher. And the researcher, by this alien language, suddenly have the ability uh, to see the future. I think, I think for me, like the, the current AI technology has forced me to think about the future. <laughs> Make me some far, far nervous, but I think I have to have to face it. Otherwise, otherwise it will be become w worse. And it gets off the, just off the back of that. I was wondering because you mentioned this notion of like rather than a, as a prompt engineer, like a story engineer. Mm. I was just wondering, like from both of you, like what do you think? Um, and this is a kind of slightly speculative question mm. here, but like um, what kinds of like creative roles do you imagine uh, emerging? Through the integration and uh, co-creations with these uh, with these models and systems, um, can you sort of uh, speculate on what possible sort of new roles will will emerge? <laughs> I know that's a tricky <laughs> I, <laughs> to putting you I on. Always, the spot. I always I sometimes mention I'm a kind of a babysitter <laughs> for the AIs. I think this already happened and will happen more. Like people need to need someone. <laughs> Or become a basic skills to to communicate with AI to ask it to uh, to clarify or ask it uh, to give your response about what you need. So I think kind of babysitter for AI. Mm -hmm. I I will say in this way, and I think I'm already kind of doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you did refer to one of your uh, your works as your as your kind of baby, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. not like a it's really. F I, I, I don't know. It's very weird. Like some people call it like you, because for example, in an exhibition, uh, I was uh, I was out in in like speaking a phone, and someone yeah. my friend sent a message: your daughter is broken. <laughs> <laughs> so the chatbot is not responding. <laughs> I don't know. I it's weird. It's it's also like it's also upon like definition of myself. Should I call call her a daughter or or not? It depends on the artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess this like um, refinement will become our role much more than an invention itself. And like the prompt engineer is a great example of like op optimizing what's available to you. But I guess, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like new roles. I guess um, it's been a real topic, you know, whether you should be allowed to use ChatGPT to write papers and things like that. And the teachers that I work with are in debate over it. And I keep thinking, like, what will what will have to happen is that we'll have to just be able to justify like a methodology for using the tools. So it will be super normal um, to write together with these language models or to create together with the um, image models. But what you'll be judged on is like your method for working with them mm -hmm. and how inventive you are with that and how you use it to create something that's not generic. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I, I really like the what you said about refinement and as well, you also mentioned like babysitter, because I feel like with prompt engineering, the, the work of that is actually quality assurance rather than invention. So, so it's about refining your methodology as well. So I think that's a, that's a much better way to look at working with AI tools rather than thinking that like, it's better to demystify it that way. Like mm -hmm. you're making sure it's streamlined to what you want to do. And maybe that's a better, yeah, better way of looking. Um, I guess and the final question I have, I mean, which touches on the um, on the summit's theme, I guess, was for both of you, I guess, like what what kinds of technologies do you sort of want to live with in the near future? Fire. Um, fire. <laughs> my, to be honest, my first idea, I want to live with Pokemons. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's not what kind of technology because we are. Uh, it's for me. I'm tr learning that, so I think everything happens naturally. But I'm think about like I really hope. I think as well, right? It happens actually. There are some kind of a wall, walls or like edge of different companies. Like you cannot link your your Chrome account to to Edge, mm -hmm. so you need to have a Microsoft account <laughs> to <laughs> apply for for um, for Microsoft <laughs> doing. I hope in future this kind of uh, boundaries can can disappear. 
I think because for example in the I think last year there's uh, people discussing metaverse, uh, but I think the the most uh, significant blocks or challenges is different big companies that don't allow the information to transform e with each other. So I think in future, um, maybe I hope to the decentralized or the this uh, boundless. Mm, borderless technology can really benefit for us. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's I not a very future, not mm -hmm. near future. I thought future. you were going to say, like, uh, your hope was that we wouldn't have to use Microsoft. <laughs> 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 I was <laughs> like, like, yes. I mean, yeah, that is <laughs> hope so, fully on hope board so. with that. <laughs> I think we're going to be using it a lot more now. Yeah, I know, I know. I think the kind of reality <laughs> will be, be kind of absolute opposite. But, um, um, okay, so I mean, has anyone else got any questions or comments? If not, I would like to thank our, our guest speakers here for a great um, session. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>